So um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we developed a set of minimum health facility requirements specifically focusing on snake bite and venoming in Africa. So I won't really focus on the community engagement toolkit that's been alluded to, but very happy to answer any questions uh, later, of course, if you have any on that. So as has already been alluded to, WHO has plans to develop this anti-venom stockpile program, um, which is focusing on the Ekitab G product by Microfarm to cover the carpet viper species. So I'm just going to use this diagram just to set the scene but not going into too much detail because Raphael will cover this shortly. But if you look at the top diagram, you can see in the blue box that we've started off by looking at all of the health facilities in the eight countries that we're looking at in Central and West Africa. Given the uh, amount of antivenom that can pragmatically be included in this stockpile, we decided just to focus on the hospitals rather than consider all of the health facilities. From the work that Anna and colleagues have done, we've been able to narrow down by looking at hospitals in just the at-risk area for the Echis species. And then we've been doing further work to try and refine this list of hospitals. So focusing on those that potentially could hold antivenom. So we're removing those that don't have inpatient beds, those that don't have cold chain, are not operational, and we've excluded all of those private hospitals as well. So we end up with this final list of hospitals that could have antivenom. But of course, as we all know, providing effective care to patients is not just about having antivenom or not. There's a lot more to providing quality care. And that's where this piece of work comes into play. If I direct you to the bottom of the slide here. So we've been looking at a series of recommendations. So identifying what is the minimum that you should have at every level of the health system in order to provide effective quality care to these patients. Okay, so we started off by inviting clinicians from Africa, from the roster of experts, to a series of two meetings where we discussed this in more detail, thrashed it out to come to a consensus. It's important to say that, of course, we had to consider what is available in Africa. Clearly, it's no point in including something if it is never available. But that being said, we want to, the list to reflect what should be present, not what is routinely available. And I guess antivenom is a good example of that often not routinely available, but certainly should be included on this list. So we developed this spreadsheet, uh, filled it in, and then sent it around for people to look at before the meetings. And then after we'd agreed it, we sent it around afterwards so people had a chance to review it again and add any further comments. We then had a third meeting with uh, a small group of experts to validate this package. So when we considered what, you know, what this should entail, it broadly comes under these eight categories that I will expand on in a bit more detail. So it was actually in our second meeting that we decided to unpick the primary level of the health system in a bit more detail. You can see this table underneath, which broadly outlines what you might expect at the primary versus secondary versus tertiary hospital. But of course, the primary level of the health system is not just a primary hospital, but it also includes primary health centers uh, and such like. So we unpicked that to discuss what sort of services, what sort of specialities you might expect at a minimum at both the health center versus the hospital. And we also looked at the opening hours. So I identified many commonalities, but also several areas where it differed between different countries. It was country specific. So this is just a screenshot of the documents. You can see exactly what it looked like and how it was completed. And this is for the medicines and equipment section. So down the left-hand side, you see the list of items. At the top, you can see the primary level in two parts, secondary and tertiary level. And then for each piece of medicine or equipment, we have a corresponding clinical skill or competency. And we have an X placed in the box where you would expect to find it. And so this list of medicines and equipment, you know, covered several categories. And as we think about these patients as being often acutely unwell, we're covering the ABCs, so airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, this is generic management of the sick patient, but that we have several uh, items on the list which are more specific um, to the management of snake bite. So thinking about the management of blisters, monitoring compartment pressures, what as a bare minimum do you need to effectively be able to form an accurate 20 WBCT, what analgesia you might need, 
and then thinking about other relevant conditions, so tetanus and anaphylaxis. We also unpicked the, you know, thinking about the ambulance service. What do you want your ambulance to have and contain in order to safely transfer a patient? And what should that vehicle look like? You know, it should need be kept securely, be full of fuel at all times, have an inflated spare tire, these sorts of things. Thinking about infrastructure then, again, these are generic points which are relevant to all health facilities really, but there must be a, a network of tr a transport network to get to that facility. There are basic amenities that it should have. So potable water, latrines, a cold chain specifically in this context. And then we identified as a minimum, what are the essential inpatient and outpatient services that you would expect for every level of the health system? And we looked at the, both the lab and radiology services as well. So whilst I've already told you about medicines and equipment, when we unpick capacity in a bit more detail, we've come up with a, a list of more generic statements. So where there is equipment present, of course, it needs to be maintained and looked after. If there are consumables required, they need to be present. Um, staff need to know how to use these machines and be able to interpret findings. Similarly, when we consider medicines, they need to be stored appropriately. And as we think of antivenom, of course, we're thinking about the fridge being at the correct temperature and that being checked regularly. And of course, guidelines that need to be available um, and easy to understand and access. We looked at human resources and not just the clinical roles, but also the non-clinical roles. Um, an understanding, of course, that many clinical staff actually take on these non-clinical roles also. And again, some more generic points about what you should expect as a minimum. So of course, staff need to be paid and paid on time. We decided to unpick the competency section a little more as well. So we wanted to really think about who should be able to do what. So we identified four key roles, staffing roles that should be, um, that we should consider who should be able to treat these snake bite patients or play a part or a role in that. So nurses and doctors, of course, we considered emergency medical services personnel as an overall term rather than the term paramedic, because it became clear through our discussions that there were countries that didn't have the role paramedic. Uh, and in different places, it just meant different things. Some had quite advanced skills, some had um, less advanced skills. And community health workers similarly might cover someone as a, a lay person or someone who did have some sort of basic training. So in terms of who, who should do what, we looked at being able to take a snake bite history, a focused history. We looked at clinical skills, again, some more generic, such as being able to insert a cannula, and some, again, more specific to snake bite. So knowing when antivenom should be given, how it should be given safely, and being able to recognize and manage those complications. And importantly, we also considered the non-technical skills, which I think are often overlooked. So being able to effectively communicate, lead a team, or um, play an effective role within a team. And lastly, health promotion. So as a bare minimum, it was agreed that verbal discussion should be had with patients and that posters and leaflets should always be present and that these should always target adults or be available to target adults and children, importantly with visual aids, which is particularly important in areas where literacy levels are low. We also agreed the topics that you know, as a very bare minimum should be discussed in both the pre-hospital setting, which generally was reassurance and an explanation of what was going on in hospital, and on discharge as well. So we're thinking about what are the complications of the snake bite? When should a patient seek help? Where from? Thinking about also giving advice on how to prevent snake bite when they go home. And if it does happen again, what the appropriate first aid management is. We agreed the language that should be used and also the location. So thinking about privacy and confidentiality. We also talked a bit about delivering the information and, you know, in some contexts, it's important that if it is a female patient, that it is a female delivering that um, information as well, and how the families and relatives should be included in that discussion, assuming the patient consents, of course. So to summarize, we had 18 people in the first meeting, 18 clinicians from 10 different countries in Africa, and 12 in the second meeting where we agreed this minimum package. We then importantly held the final third meeting where we had clinical experts all with experience in Africa who reviewed this and we had an interesting discussion to make sure that this is both evidence-based and in keeping with best practice. So we added some things, we also removed some things such as tranexamic acid 
This is used to stop bleeding, but in the case of snake bite, it was felt that the evidence base to support it in this context was limited and that it should not be included. We also had an interesting discussion about best practice of uh, management of blisters, so aspiration versus de-roofing the blister and what might guide a clinician uh, as to you know, which of those to take. Supporting emergency care guidelines are also being reviewed in order to make sure, again, that this is evidence-based, the doses that have been used. So next steps. So as I said, this is very much a supporting tool for the anti-venom stockpile program and for countries. It is important to say that it is not WHO's role to say where the antivenom should be placed in the stockpile program, but the ownership will be with the countries. They will decide. So that we'll have a list of hospitals that could hold the antivenom with the cold chain. And then they will have this tool as well, and they can decide where the antivenom should be placed. Um, it might also identify areas where improvements could be made. I hope that it will also inform training needs and the design of training programs. It is not just, of course, for these countries in the pilot program, but for all countries to use in Africa, so it will be made available online after a consultation process. Um, this package is tailored to Africa, but we would like to repeat this tailored to Asia and also develop a more global version as well. So I don't know why I keep skipping, but thank you uh, to all of my WHO colleagues and to everyone who participated in the process. And if I just might um, end, as we're all paying homage to Professor Sir David Wilde today, to also add my thanks um, for all the time you've given me. And it's uh, you know because of you that I'm uh, interested in snake bites and got interested about six years ago. So huge thanks for the time that you've put in um, to support me over the years. Thank you, Beth. So, questions in the room first? Back again. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm, I'm Leah again from Oxford Bridge University. Um, Bethany, thank you so much for your talk. It's absolutely fantastic the work you guys have all done on that. Um, again, sort of following on from the question I asked them, um, Mike, um, what might be any major differences you're expecting in the work that you've been doing in Sub-Saharan Africa versus uh, in Asia? Is there anything, practices you think that might have to be addressed um, more in Asia, or do you think there might be um, uh, better equipped hospitals out of interest? Okay, so how do I see the package differing? Yes, if I understand that's correctly it, yes. from Africa I'm so sorry. to Asia. That's it. <laughs> yeah, and the capacity of the hospitals. Um, I suppose the development of this is sort of independent to what the hospitals have, um, although of course we need to take into consideration what is available. Um, but I think it, well, yes, we'll have a discussion with the clinicians. I imagine actually many of the, thing, the, the things on the list will be the same. You know, there are issues that are common. Uh, we have, um, you know, snakes in both regions that cause some of the same complications, but also there are, will be a few differences. But I imagine that the key bulk of it will be the same with a few minor tweaks is my expectation. Thank you very much. And then online, if you have a question online, please unmute. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Beth.